Hi, this is Matthew Robert Payne, and uh, and this is uh, video two uh, of of uh, a teaching uh, called "The Will of God Brings You New Life and Real Love." Um, I'm going through. Uh, it was 35, but 34 points uh, that a woman, uh, a friend of mine on Facebook made. Uh, so we're going through them one by one. I may uh, complete uh, the last uh, 33 points, uh, 23 points in one video or make it take two. Point number 11 is uh, he wants to offer a safe, fully protected foundation for us so many of us have uh, come from a life of abuse I know personally uh, I grew up uh, with a father that had anger issues uh, my father was constantly uh, bubbling uh, with anger underneath the surface and any little thing uh, would set him off and uh, he would have an outburst of anger. Galatians uh, calls uh, what uh, my father had as outbursts of wrath. And uh, if not repented of and cleaned up, uh, the Apostle Paul says uh, this uh, lust of the flesh can actually uh, take you to hell. And thankfully, uh, later in his life, an apostle travelled to our town, seriously rebuked my father, uh, gave him a recipe uh, for repentance, and over a couple of years, uh, my father repented and changed. But my early life uh, was uh, dealt uh, with a father that uh, was always angry and always uh, getting upset and always exploding um, I was also uh, rejected uh, by uh, my father when I was in the womb, uh, when uh, my mother found out she was pregnant uh, with a third child. Uh, my father uh, exploded because he only planned on having two children. So I grew up uh, with uh, rejection uh, from uh, my father and uh, my uh, brother had a serious case of sibling rivalry and used to uh, like bash me up and uh, do uh, violence to me. So I didn't have a really uh, loving uh, role models as males uh, in my life. Uh, so um, my father uh, used to uh, get upset with me uh, when I disagreed with him or I didn't do everything according to his command and uh he i'd often uh get uh in trouble uh, for disobedience or uh standing up to him and uh he would uh bend me over my bed even when i was a teen and uh tell me to take my pants down and he'd hit me uh, with a really uh, heavy leather belt and it used to make me cry it really hurt uh so uh, when uh, we meet a father who is all loving and uh, compassionate and caring, uh, it can be uh, hard to approach. I know that uh, I uh, hung around uh, with uh, like a mentally unwell a person that had a prophetic gift and he was my only friend in the world uh, for quite a while and uh he uh, one day he was at McDonald's with me and uh, he filled up with tears and uh, he started crying and uh, and uh, I said what's the matter and he said God just uh, spoke to me uh, he he said he he's he's not an angry God he's he's not angry like your father he he's more like Jesus he's full of love and just as Jesus loves you, He loves you, and He's He promises He'll 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 never get angry with 
you if uh, you approach him. And uh, uh, through the love of Jesus, we find uh, that uh, the Father was best uh, demonstrated uh, in the life of Jesus Christ and uh, the compassionate, loving, forgiving uh, Jesus that used to uh, stay up all day and night and uh, lived many days without uh, going to sleep uh, is uh, best represents the father. And when uh, we shared uh, the prodigal son uh, story before, I've, I've lived uh, so much of my life as a prodigal. And uh, for years, while I was addicted uh, to prostitutes, I didn't go to church because I felt uh, so shameful. So I lived that life of uh, earning my wages and uh, going and uh, sleeping with a prostitute. And I lived uh, the life of the prodigal. I wasted all the money. Um, three of my family, my, my brother, my sister, and my younger brother all own their own house. I spent a fortune. I spent uh, all my money uh, on uh, prostitutes. And uh, it, uh, it's a real shame. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, it says that uh, the adulterous woman will uh, get you in her snare and uh, and she'll send you broke. She'll take all your money. And uh, she did. So uh, when I finally uh, returned to church and Jesus uh, wooed me and finally uh, introduced me uh, to his father, uh, that father best represented uh, the prodigal son's father. He he was a father that ran to me with open arms and a hug and love. And uh, I've heard uh, the father cry over me. Uh, saints have reported to me uh, that uh, when uh, the father speaks of you, his eyes uh, fill with tears. Uh, the the father is still crying. Uh, with uh, compassion and love for me. So um, the Father, when uh, you get to know uh, God uh, as your Father, uh, you come to understand him uh, in a real uh, loving way. And uh, so many uh, people who've had uh, their Father sexually abuse them or be violent to them uh, would have a hard time uh, relating to a father, and it took me uh, many, many years, over 20 years, <clears throat> uh, traveling with Jesus before I finally accepted uh, the love of the father. But uh, the father uh, has been especially loving to me. He he offers a safe, uh, fully uh, protected uh, form of love and the way that he allows the Holy Spirit uh, to integrate uh, scripture into your life, the, the way that he works with your memory and uh, the the Holy Spirit orchestrates good uh, teachers to come into your life to teach you the word of God and teach you not only scriptures, but the real meanings of scriptures and to teach you the meanings of scriptures in context so you can understand the word of God and you can start to apply the word of God to your life. Uh, it builds a really firm and strong foundation for you. So um, I spent a long time uh, in my addiction, but I was growing in the Lord. I was growing in intimacy. Uh, I, uh, I first uh, met God uh, in heaven face to face. And it was three days after I'd uh, slept with a prostitute and I didn't uh, feel uh, worthy to actually meet God. And uh, um, I told the counsellor I didn't feel worthy of meeting him. And the counsellor said, uh, Jesus' blood uh, made you worthy. And then uh, the counsellor asked me, why wasn't I moving towards the throne room? And I said, I feel like he'll strike me dead. And uh, the counsellor said, you've got Jesus holding your hand. Jesus isn't going to take you into the throne room to meet his father, only for his father to strike you dead. You're safe with Jesus. And Jesus had to personally escort me into the throne room. Um, and I met the father face to face. Um, and ever since I met him, my life has been transformed. Point number 12 
He waits for each of us to hear his call. He waits for us to surrender and he waits patiently. So I was uh, saved uh, when I was eight years of age and uh, after uh, the age of 18, uh, when I left my family home, I stopped going to church. My uh, mother may have thought uh, something uh, was wrong with me uh, not to uh, go to church, but I hid uh, my sexual abuse and my sin life. And uh, when I got to the big smoke, uh, the city of Sydney, away from my uh, town uh, house, uh, in Coffs Harbour, a country town uh, in New South Wales, 600 kilometres uh, from the city, I uh, discovered uh, prostitutes, street walking prostitutes. And uh, after I spent $20 on my first prostitute, I became addicted. I soon learned uh, that uh, the more you pay uh, for the service, the better quality a prostitute uh, that uh, you can hire and uh, you can uh, go higher and higher in quality uh, with prostitutes, um, getting uh, them younger and prettier and doing more things for you that you enjoy uh, the more you spend and you can spend an absolute uh, fortune on them. So I uh, got married, stayed married for two and a half years and my wife left me. I was a mess. I was a broken man. And uh, I um, then uh, remained uh, single for most of my life. Uh, since then, um, I uh, took many, many years in a relationship uh, with Jesus uh, before Jesus asked me one day uh, uh, that, uh, I should, uh, from now on, uh, talk to his father. And uh, he introduced me to his father, and uh, I started uh, talking to the father. So God uh, waited like 30 years for me uh, from uh, when I was saved. He was uh, very patient uh, waiting uh, for me. And finally, like it says uh, John in John 14.6, uh, no one comes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus uh, said uh, that he was the door, and uh, he uh, was the door to the sheep, and uh, Jesus uh, certainly was uh, the door uh, to his Father. He was the way to his Father. Uh, I had a deep and personal relationship uh, with Jesus, and uh, as I came to understand uh, that everything I knew of Jesus uh, was found in the Father. Everything of the Father uh, was found in Jesus, and that they, they were one. Uh, I uh, came to uh, quickly accept uh, my uh, relationship uh, with the Father, and it grew uh, pretty strong from it. So uh, God had... Uh, been uh, silently waiting. He's had a call on my life. Uh, of course, I uh, read many scriptures over the years as I was uh, reading the Word of God and going to church from time to time. Uh, I read many scriptures that uh, said that all of Jesus' words and everything he did, uh, he saw his Father doing, and uh, he er or everything he spoke uh, Jesus said were his father's words and I only do uh, what I see the father doing I only speak uh, his words so I knew that all the words that I respected that Jesus had said all of uh, the 50 commandments of Jesus all the parables of Jesus everything that, that uh, uh, Jesus said and did was happened uh, because of his relationship with the father and so uh, over the years, through the 30 years, uh, it wasn't wasted. The father uh, was silently calling me. He was calling me uh, through his son. He was demonstrating uh, his character and his personality uh, through my knowledge of his son. And uh, that's why uh, after all those years, I've got such a, a beautiful and loving uh, relationship uh, with uh, the Father God. Uh, he uh, 
he he awaits uh it says here he he waits for us to surrender and uh we we can be strong and we can be prideful and we can be obstinate 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 uh, we can uh, be disobedient. Uh, we can have wayward lives. Uh, we can uh, be so far from God, and God will woo us. He will. He will uh, coach us. He, he will call us. He will uh, wait uh, patiently uh, for us uh, to surrender and uh, come uh, to His call and uh, approach Him. Uh, so I met uh, God in heaven, and uh, He He uh, showed me the heavens, uh, and uh, showed me the galaxies, and uh, it's like He opened up the roof of the uh, stadium in heaven that I call His throne room. I saw it like a stadium uh, with His throne in the middle, and uh, He opened up uh, the court the roof of it like it was a covered stadium and i saw all the galaxies and he said can you see all that and i said yes he said i control all of that and i said yes and he says at any one time i can grab one of those stars and uh, send it down to earth and that would be the end of earth and i said yeah he said don't you think if i can control all of that that i can control your life and I said, yes. He said, why don't you let me control your life? And uh, from that time on, I, I, I think I started uh, to uh, be uh, directed um, by the Holy Spirit. I, I wondered how uh, God uh, could take control of a person's life that was sleeping with prostitutes. And I wondered for many years since I had that encounter, how was God controlling my life and allowing me to still uh, be in the addiction to prostitutes? But he led me to himself, and uh, I've reached the stage that I reached uh, getting set free 17 weeks ago. And so you can't argue uh, with the wisdom of God. Point number 13, he brings people into our life to pray for us even if we've never heard of the word of God before. So in in my life, uh, I was eight years of age and uh, my mother initially uh, met uh, my father and uh, my father uh, was dating uh, my mother and, uh, and uh, he asked her, are you a Christian? And she says, no. And uh, and he said, good, I don't want to date a Christian. And my, my father was a backslidden Christian, and uh, uh, his first fiance that my father had uh, had broken up with him because she said he didn't have uh, a committed uh, relationship with Jesus. Uh, he wasn't committed and as close to Jesus as uh, she wanted him to be, and he wouldn't be able to take leadership over her and lead the house effectively uh, with a weak relationship with Jesus. So that had really uh, broken my father's heart and he was deeply offended. Uh, so he uh, wanted to make sure that his second wife, uh, second wife uh, wouldn't be a Christian so she wouldn't break up with him uh, for that reason. And uh, I lived with a father uh, most of my life that was a pretty weak Christian and one that I uh, didn't put uh, much time into Christianity. My, my mother had four children and uh, and uh, sometimes she used to uh, have uh, us uh, looked after, the three youngest children at least, uh, looked after by her next door neighbour who was a praying woman. And uh, she was a beautiful woman, and the next door neighbor was older than my mother. And uh, she offered uh, to uh, do respite or babysit us children uh, whenever my mother wanted to go out uh, with her husband, our father, or uh, she simply wanted a break from the children. My my brother had um, uh, uh ringing in his ear my older brother had a ringing in his ear that used to 
uh, frustrate him and uh, cause uh, he wax. He had wax in his ears that like, tickled his ears and used to uh, cause sensations in his ears and it used to uh, drive him crazy. So he often uh, got angry and uh, banged his head against the wall to try and uh, stop the wax from affecting him. And uh, apart from that, uh, my older brother was uh, pretty uncontrollable. He also, because his, his hearing problem, he had a speech impediment. And uh, many times I had to be uh, brought uh, to his classroom uh, to interpret uh, what he was saying to his teachers. And that used to uh, humiliate uh, my older brother that his younger brother had to come and speak in baby language to his teacher to interpret him and uh, that uh, didn't bode well uh, for me uh, not uh, being uh, treated with violence uh, from my older brother. So uh, uh, this lady used to uh, pray for my mother and uh, witness to my mother. I was just a beautiful Christian to my mother. Uh, and uh, my mother used to ask how the children were because uh, we were pretty uh, unbehaved. Uh, children were a, a bit of trouble uh, for my mother. My mother actually thought that she was a hopeless parent because she couldn't uh, control my older brother Rodney and uh, the other children uh, were a little out of control too and uh, my mother thought that she was not a very good mother and uh, she used to ask uh, Betty Fleming uh, every time uh, that uh, she met her and she looked after the children how were the children and Betty Fleming said uh, that uh, the children uh, were great. And uh, my mother said, didn't they play up? And she said, no, children aren't allowed to play up in my house. And uh, and uh, my mother said, why? And she said, because Jesus uh, lives in my house and children uh, don't play up. They're not allowed to by Jesus. And my mother thought that was interesting because her mother uh, was a white witch and uh, she, her mother used to go to mediums and uh, 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 go to uh, clairvoyants and psychics and uh, uh, my mother's mother was into witchcraft and it's as far as she knew that uh, Jesus died 2,000 years ago and, and yet this uh, Betty uh, talked about Jesus as though he was alive, alive, uh, Betty used to invite my mother to a Christian women's um, meeting uh, once a month. And uh, uh, my mother used to uh, listen to the speakers, but she never really understood uh, what the speakers say. But uh, she used to enjoy uh, preparing the food and washing up uh, with the Christian women. And she was fascinated because these Christian women uh, kept on talking about this Jesus uh, who seemed to be living to them. He he seemed to be a real person in uh, uh, their life and they talked about him like he was really living and he wasn't dead and he hadn't died 2,000 years ago, but he was still living in some way. Um, one time uh, it fascinated my mother uh, so much uh, that uh, she asked about this Jesus uh, that uh, kept her children at bay and kept the children uh, behaving. And uh, and um, Betty said that he's alive and he rose from the dead and he's in heaven and he listens to our prayers and he looks after us. And, uh, and my mother was skeptical and uh, Betty said to her something really wise. She said, uh, if, uh, if you want to know if uh, Jesus exists, just pray to him. I know, I know it'll be hard for you to imagine that he exists, but just pray to him and ask him to do something really meaningful for you uh, that shows that he loves you and he cares for you. And uh, so my mother went home that night and felt really strange talking to the air. And she said, Jesus, Betty says that uh, if I pray to you and ask you to do something meaningful for me to prove that you exist and that you love me, uh, that I can pray for it and you'll do it. 
So uh, I'm just praying for you to do something meaningful for me to show me that you love me. And uh, that night, my brother stopped banging his head and my brother stopped playing up and he started acting as a perfect child. And my mom, mother let it go for a, a week and then she finally confessed to Betty uh, what my brother had done and she'd never seen my brother so well behaved. And uh, she had to confess that uh, Jesus was alive and he really did care for her. And he did the most meaningful thing that could have ever been done for her. So uh, whilst I only had a mother that uh, knew that I wasn't a Christian and used to pray for me, it was uh, Betty Fleming that uh, brought the Christianity uh, into my family's life. And because of Betty, uh, my uh, my mum became a praying mother. She prayed for a whole family. My father recommitted his life and we grew up uh, going to church and I went to church each week. Sometimes on a Sunday I'd go Sunday morning and Sunday night with my mother and I had a really strong faith up until the day I was molested. Um, and I still continued my faith as much as I can, uh, but just entered into a life of uh, rejection and sin and confusion. Um, but uh, it's true, God does uh, bring people into our lives that are praying people and uh, and praying people uh, lead people to the Lord. My mother firmly believes that no one can uh, become a Christian unless they first have a loved one or someone they know praying for their salvation. So it's important uh, if you know people and you're Christian and you're uh, listening to reading this, uh, it's important that uh, you keep your friends and your loved ones in prayer because that prayer activates someone to come into their life like Betty Fleming uh, to lead them to Christ. Point number 14, he came briefly into our hearts during that one time long ago when we allowed ourselves to be just desperate and vulnerable enough to cry out, God, who are you to me? So many of us uh, live a sort of uh, reprobate life. I was living a life uh, uh, going to work uh, 40 hours a week, uh, drinking on weekends. I, I uh, learned uh, to go up to the red light district uh, to uh, 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 a strip club and brothel uh, in uh, the red light district, and I'd go out there on seven thirty on a on a Friday night, and uh, they used to have uh, a woman that uh, performed uh, on the rotation of the strippers. They had about uh, six strippers that used to go uh, and travel between four different strip clubs and do all the stripping, and then when the men uh, we're excited. Uh, prostitutes uh, used to uh, take them upstairs to have sex. And uh, one of uh, the women who used to come around every couple of hours uh, used to take one of the men uh, from the audience and have sex with him on stage. And I was uh, a young uh, guy that uh, used to enjoy sex. I certainly enjoyed free sex. And uh, the women were always uh, pretty good and pretty attractive. And uh, and uh, so I used to say to the bouncer on a Friday night uh, that uh, she can pick me. And uh, she'd come in to uh, start stripping and she'd come and tap me in the shoulder and she said, you're the one? And I, I, I'd say yes. So in around about the third song, she'd come and... Uh, pick me up and take me on the stage and I'd have uh, sex on stage. And because I'd had uh, sex on stage, um, I uh, had my sex for the night. So when I went out to nightclubs and dancing clubs, I was more relaxed and I wasn't seemed to be desperate uh, when I was trying to uh, pick up girls. So many times uh, you've lived a life uh, drinking and getting uh drunk and uh, I know uh, there's been times uh, in my life where I uh, I uh, tried to go to sleep and the whole ceiling 
was spinning round and round. I was so drunk. And uh, in those times, in those desperate times, you cry out to God, uh, you cry out to Jesus, I used to, and ask him uh, if uh, he could help you, uh, that uh, you would remember it and you'd commit your life. And you'd uh, go back uh, to church for a couple of weeks and then you'd go back into your reprobate life. So in those times when I used to cry out to Jesus, Jesus always responded. I... Uh, I um I remember uh years uh years past where I didn't attend church for years. I I um was a person who didn't want to be a hypocrite and many people um don't attend church for that reason because uh they're doing sinful sort of lifestyle, they're having like a sinful lifestyle and doing things. Uh, that uh, they know the Bible teaches against, like uh, living with a partner outside of marriage or or uh, having affairs or drinking too much or doing drugs or uh, stealing from the workplace or stealing from the government. They're doing some uh, sin that they know that God uh, wouldn't approve of. So because they're living that sort of life, uh, they uh, would feel like a hypocrite if they uh, went to church. Uh, many people are just people that have a belief in God and uh, they pray to God every night and uh, and yet they don't uh, go to organized religion because they seem that uh, the people in organized religion don't seem to uh, be any better than them and uh, don't seem to... Uh, behave uh, any better or uh, in any special way and uh, and because they're sinning, because they're living their lives not according to uh, what the Bible uh, teaches, uh, they don't personally uh, go to church because uh, they would feel that they're a hypocrite. It's actually their righteousness. It's actually their sense of righteousness and holiness that stops them from darkening the doors of a church. And many people, the only time they actually attend a church is at weddings and funerals. And even then they feel a little overwhelmed uh, being in the presence of God. So there was quite a number of times uh, during my prodigal lifestyle that I called out to Jesus and Jesus responded. Uh, so uh, many people have uh, these experiences uh, in their life uh, where uh, they briefly uh, call out to God um, and uh, and um, and uh, God answers them and shows them a visible sign that uh, he really is there and he really does care. Point number 15, that's why many of us who have been saved share the gospel. We just want everyone to receive this love and safety, the goodness of this love under his wings. I have to uh, personally confess that uh, I live a life now that uh, is so happy uh, for uh, all my life I've uh, struggled uh, with these addictions like I've shared and uh, it just, I I had uh, so much uh, guilt and condemnation from it. I felt uh, so guilty and weighed down uh, by my sin and it wasn't uh, Jesus uh, condemning me. It wasn't uh, Jesus making me feel uh, condemned. It was me condemning myself and not being able to uh, forgive myself for my lifestyle. I, it uh, brought conviction uh, from uh, the Bible into my life and I felt guilty and shameful uh, for my life. So even though uh, in the last 10, 11 years I've grown uh, really close to Jesus, I could never really uh, get uh, too close to him uh, because I continued every uh, two weeks uh, when I got uh, my disability pension to go and uh, see a prostitute. Um, uh, so um, 
I, uh, but I've reached a stage where uh, for the last uh, six or seven years, I've uh, been writing and self-publishing a book every month. And uh, uh, for, for years, uh, the books went well. And then about three years ago, uh, Amazon sales tanked and uh, the books uh, really uh, went from uh, some of the books going 15 and 10 copies of a book per month down to one or two. And uh, unless I make my books uh, for no charge on Amazon, uh, they only get one or two downloads a month. And uh, you spend uh, money producing a book like $600 or $700 for me now uh, to uh, produce a book. And uh, it's disappointing uh, if you make them 99 cents uh, that uh, only two or three uh, get uh, downloaded each month. It's a lot of money uh, for no real return. So these days I, I make uh, my books uh, free on Amazon in America and uh, produce them free on other websites. Uh, knowing uh, the will of God, knowing the purpose of God uh, for me to uh, post things on Facebook each day uh, for me uh, to do uh, teachings on YouTube each day uh, for me to write books and communicate uh, the truths of the kingdom of God and um, that scripture that says uh, in Isaiah 42 to open blind eyes uh, so much of my ministry writing books is uh, taking the blindness off Christians' eyes. So many uh, Christians uh, are, are blinded uh, to the truth and they're not really taught the truth. And uh, Jesus talked about uh, the blind leading the blind. And uh, if the blind leaders lead the blind, well, they'll both uh, fall into a ditch. And I find that uh, my whole purpose uh, in writing books, or much of my purpose in writing books is showing uh, Christians the real truth and teaching the real truth um, and uh, exposing the fact uh, that uh, most uh, people in the Christian church aren't being taught uh, the proper truth and the narrow way uh, that uh, Jesus teaches. So I find so much satisfaction uh, working in my destiny and working in my purpose and fulfilling my purpose. I have uh, little uh, financial needs and uh, I tend to be able to uh, live on a little bit of money. So uh, $300 out of uh, my uh, disability pension per month uh, goes into publishing books. And then I've got a, like a $600 income per month uh, that comes in uh, from people donating uh, to my ministry. So it really uh, puts me uh, in a great place. So um, three times a week, three or four times a week, I go out uh, to shopping centres just to uh, buy lunch and uh, just to spread the love of Jesus uh, with strangers and walk up to strangers and uh, give them uh, spiritual readings like personal prophecies for strangers and uh, and give them uh, personal messages for Jesus. I'm just uh, bursting uh, with the love of Jesus and I just uh, carry the light of Jesus everywhere that I go and I love to uh, share the love of love and truth of Jesus uh, with strangers. I don't uh, go to uh, a job, I don't attend a job, so I haven't got a regular 10 or 12 people that I do life with, that I mix with every day like the ordinary person. Uh, so many people have got a job and they're part of a workforce and I've got uh, regular people that they meet each day so they can be a witness. And those uh, five books uh, that I spoke about, uh, about evangel evangelism, uh, if uh, you read those books and understand those books, then uh, that will uh, show you how to have an evangelistic uh, outreach and and uh, method uh, to reaching people and sharing uh, the good news with people and, and uh, demonstrating the light of Christ and the character of Christ and drawing people uh, into asking you questions about uh, Jesus. So, so many uh, people like uh, the girl who... 
uh, wrote uh, these points have uh, had uh, a really uh, transformative uh, past and have had such a radical encounter with God and have come from uh, sad pasts and troubled pasts and pasts with trials and struggles in it and have just been so overcome with the love of God and so captivated with the love of God and so healed and set free and delivered um, by the love of God that they're just bursting with happiness and bursting with joy and just wants to want to reach out and tell everyone they can about uh, the uh, goodness of uh, living in a deep and abiding relationship uh, with God the Father. So the girl who uh, writes this, uh, writes a really good uh, post on Facebook and she's a really loving and deep and a wonderful girl and she's got a great uh, relationship uh, with God the Father. I don't know how we even became connected on Facebook. I think uh, that uh, she commented on one of my friend's posts and I like what she posts. So I think I uh, friend requested her because of a comment, uh, but I'm really glad uh, we're in touch. So um, I haven't got uh, friends or people in a workplace that I can witness to every day and be a witness, uh, but uh, I've got uh, I've got carers that come and look after me because I've got a mental illness and take me out shopping and go out socially with me, and I'm a witness to them, and I demonstrate Christ in their life. Um, but uh, uh, so many uh, people with uh, great testimonies and great stories of deliverance and great stories of restoration and the overwhelming loving uh, feeling and uh, blessing of a relationship with God uh, can provide, uh, become great witnesses of his love and want to share that with everyone that they meet. Point 16. I know some may have other motives, but genuine love and care, the motives. I know some may have other motives, but genuine love and care are the motives of many. I personally believe that uh, every uh, Christian for them to have a good uh, relationship with Jesus, need a personal touchstone uh, to demonstrate the character of Jesus uh, with them. Uh, in my time uh, in the Christian faith, I've had a couple of uh, people uh, in my life that have demonstrated uh, the character of Jesus to me. I've got a, a friend uh, called Mary uh, who has uh, uh, become what Michael Jackson would call a fan of mine. Uh, she tends to read half of the books I produce. She's read over 60 of my books and read, uh, listened uh, to many of my videos. Uh, she's not only read 60 of my books, but she's written reviews for 60 of my books and uh, and uh, she's been a real blessing. And she not only ha reads my books and she not only understands me through my books and is con constantly growing and learning and proving that she's growing and learning uh, through her conversations with me, but I've spent uh, a lot of time speaking on the phone with her and having uh, long one-hour conversations with her uh, every second day or most days, and I've really uh, grown close to her. She's proven uh, that uh, she understands my past. She understands my addiction. She's known me uh, for five or six years and known that I was stuck in addictions, and it's never stopped her from loving me. It's never stopped her from accepting me. She, she definitely has made uh, me... Uh, uh, understand that uh, it's not right behavior and it's not a good behavior 
but she understood that I was caught in an addiction and I had uh, demonic strongholds in my life and I had uh, personal trauma and unhealed pain in my life that allowed the demons to stay and they had doorways into my life. And so uh, she just bared with me and accepted me. So she accepts my past. She accepts where I come from. Uh, she accepts my present. She accepts I struggle. She uh, accepts that sometimes I struggle uh, with mental illness and I may stay up uh, too long uh, for more than a day or two and I may get a little bit delusional and uh, she understands uh, when I get a bit delusional then she's such a close friend now that uh, sometimes she'll question what I say and I uh, say that uh, that uh, doesn't really resonate with her and uh, she doesn't uh, believe that is the truth and uh, that's just a really polite and loving way of saying I think you may be being a bit delusional there Matthew and uh, normally within a day or so I'll get back to her and say thank you for that I was uh, speaking delusional I was deceived in that instance so I've had uh, God the Father not be God the Father when he spoke to me I've had uh, Jesus not really be the real Jesus that spoke to me I've had my angel, my scribe angel Bethany, uh, not be the real scribe angel Bethany speaking to me. And uh, when one of these uh, uh, deceptive voices masquerade as the truth and speak to you, uh, what they say to you can lead you in, lead you astray, and lead you into delusional thoughts and get you on the wrong path. So. She's uh, grown with me and lived with me and travelled with me uh, through ups and downs and she has stuck uh, closer than a brother. It says in scripture that a friend can be closer than a brother and Mary uh, is like a real uh, dear friend. Um, so uh, some people have other motives, uh, but uh, genuine uh, love and care are the motives of many mary mary doesn't want anything from me she doesn't want money off me she doesn't uh, want fame off me she doesn't want me to uh share her posts on facebook she doesn't uh she do, she doesn't post many things on facebook anyway but uh, she doesn't want to promote herself through me she doesn't want to be recognized by me she doesn't uh, want uh uh, more of my time she doesn't want my money there's there's nothing she wants from me except my friendship and she says she's 66 and 66 or 67 she said it's so good to have like a younger brother uh, someone to love a male to love a male to be a friend of and uh, she said a couple of times that uh, if it was 15 years ago and we're younger and we're in the same state Perhaps we could have been an item and it's really uh, pleasing to know that she considers you lovingly like that. Uh, but uh, we're a platonic friendship and she she doesn't want anything but me being a friend. And she, she's so chuffed uh, that she knows an author. She She's so uh, pleased uh, that... Uh, that she can be a friend of mine and speak into my life. And some people come in uh, to your life to control you and uh, to use you and manipulate you and uh, get their will in your life. And uh, often uh, people with a Jezebel spirit will come into your life and try and control you and manipulate you and use you for their own agenda. Well, Mary has no agenda. She just loves me. And uh, she loves me how uh, Jesus loves me. And Mary is like a really good touchstone of Jesus in my life. And uh, she's just a wonderful, uh, loving, uh, supportive female. And if you went uh, back to the reviews, she had a break out of my life for about a year. But if you go back in the reviews about three or four years ago on some of my books from three or four years ago, you'll see 
every uh, book on the first page of Amazon, you'll see a review from Mary where she consistently uh, posted a book review on my book um, the day it came out or the day after it came out. And at that time, if you posted a review first on Amazon and it got a few votes by other readers, it stayed on the first page. So Mary has been consistently there for me and consistently loving to me. I have other friends uh, that um, are in my life. I've got a friend called Dundee who also uh, had a time where he was reading all my books and Dundee has read about uh, 50 of my books and I talk to him uh, two or three times a week uh, for, for a lot of times. One time he was driving uh, from one state to another and he had a six-hour drive and uh, he just had his phone uh, plugged in on his car and we had a, like a five-hour conversation and that's the sign of a good friend that uh, you can uh, talk to them for five hours and never have a pause and never have uh, people feeling insecure, never having uh, a reason to try and come up with something to say, but have uh, such a strong friendship uh, based on love and based on understanding of each other that you could just chat and chat and chat for five hours. So in the Christian church, uh, they can be people in your life uh, that uh, genuinely love you and don't have ulterior motives and just love you as a friend. And Dundee says he hasn't got many friends and he really appreciates me as a friendship. I often I say to him, thanks uh, for being my friend. And uh, he says back to me, thanks for being mine. And uh, so uh, Dundee is like an airline pilot and uh, he... He uh, is uh, the captain of an aeroplane, so he's the one in charge of a big aeroplane. And uh, I I saw once uh, the ratings of people according to the job, and I think uh, judge, like judges got number one, but really high up on the list uh, was airline pilots. And uh, so I've always felt as especially special uh, having an airline uh, pilot as a best friend. So we all need in the Christian life uh, to actually grow uh, close to Jesus or closer to Jesus. We all tend to need someone who demonstrates to us the love and the acceptance of Jesus Christ himself. And uh, I found that uh, even though my two friends don't seem to know as much as me. Um, <laughs> I have to laugh there. Even though my two friends don't seem to be as informed as me about the Christian gospel, uh, they're two very dear friends that I can talk about anything with and discuss things at length. When uh, you read uh, this, Mary, please understand that I said uh, those last couple of sentences in jest and it was a joke and uh, if you actually uh, watch the video you'll see that I actually laughed point number 17 he wants to father us care for us he wants to teach us with love and by truth I uh, I'm really having like a special time uh, going through these points because uh, I've always had like a tremendously strong and intimate uh, relationship uh, with Jesus. And I've just tended to know the Father uh, through the relationship that I have with Jesus. Uh, when I uh, first <coughs> met the Father, Jesus said to me one day in prayer, uh, from now on, I want you to approach my father. And when you pray, I want you to pray to my father. And I said, uh, so you want me to speak to him now? And Jesus said, yeah. And I said, can I come back and speak to you after I finish? And he said, sure you can. And uh, so I uh, said goodbye to him. And I said, hello, father. And he said, hello, Matthew. 
And the feeling I got of God the Father there was like I was his son's favorite friend. It was like he was uh, the CEO of a company and the owner of the company and one of the uh, main representatives of the company was his son and I'd been working in his son's uh, part of uh, the company and grown up always working for the son but had never met the CEO and the owner of the company and it's like I'd been marched into the boardroom uh, by the son and introduced to the father and the father had known me as the star performer in his son's part of the business and uh, it was like when I met the father the the feeling of respect was just enormous that uh, it's like I, I know everyone thinks that uh, they're Jesus' best friend and everyone uh, actually thinks that uh, they're Jesus' favourite person, but when I met the Father, it's like I was. It's like Jesus' best friend had just been introduced to him and uh, he treated me with so much love and respect. That I started to pray. I don't normally... I uh, pray like normal people. I don't uh, pray normal prayers unless I'm asked to pray for someone, uh, for, for them, unless a person asks me to pray for them. I don't pray one-way prayers. I don't uh, just pray to God and ask him all sorts of things and uh, talk to him in a one-way prayer. I have two-way conversations. So when I have... Uh, when I pray to Jesus, I'm not praying a one-way prayer. I have a conversation. I ask questions. Then he answers the questions, and he asks me questions, and I answer those questions, and we have a conversation. I believe uh, that's the proper uh, relationship that you should have with God is you have discussions with him and conversations with him because he's your father, and that's what you do with your father. You don't sit at the table and talk to your father for half an hour and your father says nothing, uh, you have a bit of give and take and you have like a two-way conversation. So when I first uh, talked to the father, I started uh, to pray like a normal person because I didn't have a relationship with him. And I asked him about one thing, uh, could he do that for me? And then the second subject I could think of uh, was... Uh, my older brother and I asked him uh, could he look after my older brother and it's like I got hit with a piece that was so strong all I remember is one time I smoked a whole uh, stick of marijuana like a whole twenty dollars worth of marijuana in one go and I got so overwhelmingly knocked out with a, a stone that I had to lay down and sleep and turn the alarms off in the gas station that I was looking after that night. I had to uh, turn turn the service station off and go to sleep and turn the cameras off so I wouldn't be busted uh, for doing it. Um, I, I just got knocked out with peace. Well, when I asked, uh, could you look after my brother, I just got knocked out with this peace uh, that was so powerful and it was like God's answer saying, your brother's going to be totally fine. Everything's going to be fine with your brother. I've since encountered that peace a number of times and I've come to understand that that peace is a higher dimension of the glory of God and God can do that through the angelic or just uh, through him uh, pumping up the peace in your life. So uh, God, uh, when I first met him, really loved me and really revered me. And as I've got to know him, I've come to know him that uh, as a person that really cares for, for me, he he uh, uses his Holy Spirit and he uses Jesus. He uses the word of God. He uses sermons. He uses teachings. He uses videos. He uses books. He uses all sorts of ways to teach me and share his love with me and share the fundamentals of the gospel with him. For seven years, I've been being 
getting inspired uh, with at least one new book uh, per month to write. And uh, I think I'm up to 114 books and I've never lacked inspiration. Just yesterday, I did like a short 30 page book. And today, uh, I've been inspired uh, to do this book, which will be about 80 pages. And uh, uh, he just uh, he just continues to inspire. He continues uh, to give me a reason to live. He continues uh, to fill me with joy. He continues uh, to teach me many things. And in order to uh, be inspired to write 114 books, you've got to be taught a lot. You've got to be continually learning. You've got to be continually researching. You've got to be continually uh, deepening your faith and getting inspired with more things and seeing more things and being taught more things. And Jesus, uh, the Father, just lovingly teaches me through the leading of the Holy Spirit, through the leading of angels, uh, through friends, through acquaintances and all different sources. He teaches me and shares things with me so that I can once again repackage what I've learned and present it to the body of Christ uh, as a new teaching in a book. Uh, I I feel that I've got a one to two hundred people that follow me and uh, are subscribed to me on Amazon, and um, a lot of them um, read uh, all the books that seem to interest them that I release. I believe. There may be about uh, 20 or 30 people that actually read every single book I produce. Uh, and I, I think there's like a larger number of 100 or 200 uh, that uh, check the titles of all my books and read every title uh, that I come up with. And the Father has got to consistently teach me uh, with his love. He's got to consistently inspire me for books and give me of the subject matter to be able to teach in books. Point number 18. Sometimes when he can't get our attention, he puts us in situations of long suffering and harsh consequences, the result of sinning, unbelieving, rebellion, and taking the will that is only his. So many, uh, uh, so many uh, people um, understand this. If if you've had uh, any time uh, in the Christian experience, if you've had any uh, years uh, in the Christian faith, you'll understand that so many times we tend to take the wheel of our own car. We take uh, the steering wheel of our own life and we start to uh, take control of what we're doing we stop uh, being led and directed by the holy spirit with our life and these different things like uh, sinning uh, entering into a state of unbelief uh, entering into a state of rebellion uh, or just simply taking things into our own hands and trying to control our own life. Sometimes uh, we can't uh, be turned around. Sometimes uh, we're going off in the wrong direction, sinning or in rebellion or doing something, and uh, God needs to uh, get our attention and bring us uh, back to himself. And he'll often use a tragedy like losing your parents, uh, to death or a sickness in the family or uh, losing a job or uh, someone foreclosing on your house or uh, your your car being repossessed or um, all different uh, calamities, all sorts of uh, troubleful, troublesome things where our whole, how our, our whole life enters into a form of emergency where we can't seem to solve it and we've got to run back to God and ask God uh, for help. 
And uh, so many times in life, uh, tragedy happens and uh, people tend to turn around and run back to God and try and reestablish uh, their relationship with God in order to get things uh, back on a more even keel. Uh, and uh, once again, once things are uh, settled and once the issue has been solved and uh, the calamity has been averted or uh, found a workaround, uh, then uh, people often go off in their own way, sinning again or in a state of rebellion again, or they start to take control of their life again and move away from the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit in their life. And it just seems to happen in cycles and cycles. Uh, God uh, will often allow things to happen uh, in our life uh, to get our attention, and to get us coming back to him and to return to him. So uh, in, in one way, I shared how I was uh, the prodigal son, uh, but uh, even in the even in the many years where I was a prodigal, uh, God would often allow something to happen in my life uh, that turned my head around and had me uh, face Jesus and talk to Jesus again. So many times when I was drunk and uh, the the roof was spinning or many times I uh, lost a job or I, I was desperate or I needed help, uh, a calamity uh, would turn me back to Jesus. And uh, uh, so the world seems to work like that. Uh, the kingdom of God uh, works like that until we learn to uh, be holy, to come out of the world, uh, to be uh, totally led by the Holy Spirit and trust the Holy Spirit uh, to lead our life. And uh, once we enter into a state uh, where uh, we can't trust ourselves with ourselves anymore. And uh, when uh, we get used to life being so sweet and so productive and so contented, uh, it being in the arms of God and uh, being in a sweet spot with God and being directed by God uh, and being so intimate with God that we're safe and protected and happy uh, until we reach a stage where we can fully trust God uh, and and God can fully trust us, uh, uh, you'll always uh, be in this going around the mountain sort of situation where uh, you get close to God, you move away from God, you get close to God, you move away from God. Uh, God is consistently bringing us around that mountain until we finally uh, come to a place uh, where we're contented to be led by him, uh, directed by him, and moved by him. And uh, that's a place that I find myself in. And uh, I uh, don't know of uh, any uh, sin that I'm doing in my life. Um, I have uh, some sort of unbelief uh, in my life when it comes to sickness. I, I don't know enough scriptures uh, in in the Bible uh, to have a belief uh, in healing and so I can't really be used uh, for healing and I can't seem to uh, get free of my mental illness uh, but uh, in no place in my life am I acting in any form of rebellion and every day I, I live I, uh, I take directions of the Holy Spirit so I'm in a pretty safe and happy place with God, and I live a life of uh, great uh, reward and great contentment, and uh, my life is full of purpose and full of joy, and I often walking uh, in the presence of God, and, and sometimes, sometimes recently, I've been walking in a measure of the glory of the Lord uh, each day, so things are pretty uh, sweet for us, uh, sweet uh, for us as the Trinity and the people that interact uh, with my life each day. But it's true uh, that God will often, uh, like, uh, 
put out that shepherd's crook and grab that stray sheep by the neck and yank him back uh, to his side. And you've seen probably seen that on cartoons, how a shepherd will do that to a stray sheep. And God seems to get out that shepherd's crook and grab a sheep by the scruff of the neck and yank it back. And uh, that's what God tends to do uh, using calamity and all sorts of uh, bad situations to uh, turn us back to him. I was going to object uh, when uh, she said he puts us in situations and I was going to object uh, to that, that uh, God doesn't put us in those situations. Uh, we put ourselves in those situations. But I can tend to understand uh, that God does in some way allow those situations to happen. And so in some respect, you could say that he puts us in those situations. So I'm not uh, being pedantic about it, but I'll have to accept my initial reading of that uh, tended to want to object that God uh, put us in a situation. I tended uh, to think that we put ourselves in those situations. Point number 19. He wants us to turn to him in times of suffering and confusion because he is the refuge and the one that will course correct our path, restoring our mind and giving us life. So Jesus uh, died uh, for us to have power and for us to have his presence and for us to be given the Holy Spirit uh, so that uh, the Holy Spirit's presence uh, can give us joy and peace and the Holy Spirit's uh, part in our life can be used to uh, lead us and direct us in our daily lives. But some of us uh, need to go through a time of suffering and confusion from time to time uh, to draw us into his arms some of us are so uh, strong-willed and so confident that we know what's right and we know how to run our own life that sometimes we need to be suffering or confused to be able to turn to him for answers. Some of us uh, think uh, that we're so good and we're so educated and we're so knowledgeable uh, and uh, we don't really need him. And there's many uh, ministries in the world who are totally run by flesh. They've got systems, they've got protocols, they've got giftings, they've got anointings by God in their life, and they're able to operate a large ministry without the leading of the Holy Spirit. And uh, sometimes those ministers need to enter into a stage of suffering, or those ministers need to get into a place where they're confused for them to turn back to their source, for them to turn back and recognize uh, God and the Holy Spirit as their source. So uh, I don't feel uh, God would uh, take any pleasure uh, in his children's suffering. I don't think uh, God uh, rubs his hands together with glee uh, when we suffer. I don't uh, think that uh, God uh, gets especially excited about my mental illness. I know uh, sometimes I get especially excited about uh, my mental illness when it allows me to be able to stay up uh, more than one night and uh, be productive uh, for 48 hours straight. But I, I don't think uh, God 
uh, is particularly happy with all the bad parts of mental illness that affect me. I don't uh, think that God is particularly happy uh, to see us suffer in order for us to learn uh, to turn to him and to cling to him. I think uh, if God could uh, get us to a state that I confess that I was in, in the last point, that I wasn't sinning. Uh, I only had a little unbelief when it came to healing. Um, I wasn't in any state of rebellion and I wasn't taking the will of my life. I think God likes to have us in that state, uh, but it's just so hard to have us in that state. So sometimes uh, God uh, will allow us to suffer uh, or allow us to get confused in order to uh, turn us back so we would seek him as our refuge and the one that uh, can bring a course correct to our path. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, I think that Misha uh, is such a beautiful woman. Uh, she she uh, shows so much of a heart uh, in these inspired points, writing these inspired points. Uh, when uh, she initially uh, posted these points, I wrote a comment saying I hadn't seen anything written so well in quite a while. And this was really, uh, really touching. And uh, I encouraged her that uh, she really needs to uh, write, write. She really needs to write a book. And uh, now, uh, since I did uh, the first uh, 10 points, I've contacted her and uh, told her that I'm going to write her 34 points uh, as a book and asked her if she could uh, comment on some of the points and agree to be a co-author in the book. Uh, so what initially started as a comment of mine saying, she should write a book, is actually going to uh, become a book that uh, she'll be involved in. So God uh, doesn't take any pleasure, and I'll say that so many times until people understand it or get the truth. He doesn't take any pleasure in people suffering. He doesn't take any pleasure in people being confused. He's not a vengeful God. He's not a cruel God. He doesn't delight in the suffering of his children, but he'll allow it so that we'll run to him and take refuge in him uh, so he can uh, bring a course correct uh, into our lives and restore our mind and give us life. God is the source of life or life uh, came from God and all originated from God and uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit were certainly involved in the creation of the world. Uh, but God is the source uh, The the Masonic Lodge, even though uh, they're mistaken and some say evil, which I agree with, uh, they speak of God as the great architect. And uh, that's uh, one of their names for God. And uh, God certainly is the source. He's an architect that had the plans uh, for this world and he had the uh, plans uh, for my life and he's got the plans uh, for your life, dear reader. And uh, sometimes uh, part of those plans that he has for your life is uh, to put you through your paces, to put you in situations that uh, make you learn that he's the boss and make you come to understand that he's a good provider and he's a loving father and uh, he's a good source uh, for you to take from and he's a place of life and he's a place of refuge and uh, he wants to woo you lovingly and and consistently 
uh, to his bosom so you can come up and climb up onto his lap and uh, place your arms around his neck and give him a big hug and stay there and don't run away and don't go off and do your own thing again but stay and trust and be comfortable in his everlasting arms. Point number 20. He just loves us so much and he wants us to sit down and be still and connect with him. Some people uh, preach. Uh, Todd Bentley is a person that... Uh, Bring, uh, it brings this to mind that they teach on entering uh, the secret place and Todd Bentley will often lay down uh, to music and he'll do what uh, people call soaking. He'll just lay present without thoughts and just meditate on God. He won't be speaking to God. God won't be speaking to him, but he'll just lay still in the presence of God and just have company with him. Just meditate and bask in his presence. And um, that's what uh, uh, that's what Misha is saying here, that God wants us to reach a stage where we can just be uh, still with him and be happy uh, in his presence. Uh, I've never reached a stage where I'm happy uh, to be like that. I've um, always laid down on my bed uh, before I was going to go to sleep and uh, I've uh, just had two-way conversations with Jesus. I've had two-way conversations with my mother. I've had two-way conversations with Bethany. I've had two-way conversations with God. And uh, we'll talk uh, back and forth. But I, I haven't, uh, not that I know of, I haven't ever just sat quietly uh, in his presence and not heard him say anything and not said anything myself. But I can understand because Todd Bentley, uh, the great evangelist, has got uh, a tremendously intimate uh, relationship with God and uh, he works in signs and wonders and does healings and uh, produces some really profound teaching. Uh, so I know that he's tremendously... Uh, deep with the Lord, he's tremendously intimate with the Lord, and uh, he uh, he gets all that intimacy. It seems from spending many hours in the secret place, simply soaking and connecting with God, and uh, it seems that uh, Misha does uh, the same thing, and. Uh, he, God just loves us so much. He just wants us to uh, connect with him. And no words need to be spoken by him and no words really need to be spoken by you. It's just uh, sometimes I get uh, uncomfortable if things aren't being said. Uh, but I understand uh, the sentiment. Uh, I know that... Uh, uh, a person uh, called uh, to speak to Paul Yonke Cho. He was, uh, I think he was uh, the leader of South Korea, uh, rang to uh, speak to Paul Yonke Cho at his ministry and um, the uh, person answering the phone, his secretary said, uh, he's with the Lord at the moment and he's asked not to be disturbed. And um, The leader of the country, I think the story goes, the leader of the country rang back every hour and it was like six hours he kept on. He was the leader of the country and he had to be kept waiting for six hours and he just 
couldn't understand why he hadn't been rang back and why they hadn't taken a message into Paul Yonke Cho. And he, he was so frustrated uh, and uh, he clearly got the message that to Paul Yonke Cho, connecting with God was more important to him and his ministry than being connected to the most important person in the country. And God wants to be that to you. Uh, I think I heard Heidi Baker say one time that she simply can't get anything done unless she spends four or five hours with Jesus uh, in his presence each morning. Um, so uh, I, I certainly uh, don't uh, spend uh, that amount of time uh, connecting with God and having conversations with God but I will say that I do uh, pray what Paul refers to is the prayer without ceasing. I'm constantly uh, in touch with the Holy Spirit and listening uh, to the Holy Spirit's uh, directions every minute of the day and doing everything uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, calls me to. And then I'll have like a half an hour debrief uh, at night time or an hour debrief as I, I go to sleep with various saints, Jesus and God. Um, but uh, Misha seems to uh, really enjoy uh, spending time with God and uh, simply uh, uh, breasting and being still uh, in the presence of God. And uh, that's just a tremendously uh, beautiful thing to hear. And uh, I, I don't, I know that uh, the five hours that Heidi Baker spends uh, in the presence of Jesus is all worship or all prayer. I think uh, that Heidi uh, would be doing some quality time soaking and uh, on the floor time with Jesus. Um, I sense that uh, Yonki Cho may not be uh, praying or having two-way conversation with God uh, for those six hours, I sense that some of that time would be just uh, sitting in the presence of God and connecting with God. And uh, But uh, these people uh, seem uh, to be uh, great people of God and uh, really uh, command uh, God's respect and attention. And uh, so it seems to... Uh, really uh, work for them. So I encourage you to uh, find uh, some soaking uh, CDs that you can download uh, in on, your, on the platforms that you use and uh, uh, even uh, get uh, one of Todd uh, Bentley's uh, teachings on The Secret Place. I think he's uh, got... Uh, mp3 collection on the secret place or a book on the secret place search that out and learn about that and uh, perhaps uh, you can uh, put that into practice in your own life well this is uh, the end of uh, part two and uh, we'll uh, carry on uh, maybe uh, the next uh, 14 questions in part three or it possibly go to part four so um, God bless you, and I, uh, I uh, look forward to um, your comments if you want to make any.